My name is Jens Christian Hermansen. I am the editor of Cosmos, a quarterly magazine about the world picture of the Danish author Martinus. I am in Holland to visit the world-renowned cardiologist Pim van Lommel, who is the author of the bestseller Consciousness Beyond Life. For more than 20 years, Dr. van Lommel has studied near-death experiences in patients who survived a cardiac arrest. In his opinion, we need to consider the possibility of a continuity of our consciousness after physical death. Pimpen Lomo, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. In your book, Consciousness Beyond Life, the Science of the Near-Death Experience, you describe that you grew up um, in an academic environment where you were taught that there is a reductionist and a materialistic explanation for everything. And you accepted that until a certain point in your life. What happens? Um, how would you describe your own journey? Well, uh, I was just had a medical study and then I was specialization in cardiology which is a lot of physics as well. I first doubted if I would study physics or or medicine. Um, and also university but also medical school so there was everybody accepted that consciousness is a product of brain function and I accepted it as well until I read a book about the death experiences in 1986 by George Ritchie, Return from Tomorrow, who as a medical student in 1943 had the near-death experience after he died of a double pneumonia. There were no antibiotics available, so he died. He was dead for nine minutes. And, a nerve, and his body was put on, just was covered with a sheet. Uh, and a nurse there was so upset that this medical student had died that he was able to persuade a medical doctor to give him an injection right into his heart with adrenaline, which was totally uncommon in that time. And after nine minutes he came back. He had a problem to find his body back because his body was covered with sheets, but he saw his hand with a fraternity ring from a student organization. That's why he knew that his body was there. And he had a very extensive near-death experience with all little aspects, positive, negative, etc. When I had read this book, I just started to ask patients who had survived a cardiac arrest in the past if they could remember something from a period of unconsciousness. Because as a cardiologist, I had the privilege to be in contact with patients who, who survived cardiac arrest. And within two years out of 50 patients, 12 patients told me about the near-death experience, which is a very overwhelming experience, and people are very reluctant to share it with others. But now, at that very moment, my scientific curiosity started to grow. So, in that time, in 1988, uh, I was so intrigued to find a real explanation about the cause and content of a near-death experience. Because I didn't believe what was written before. Uh, patients who shared the NDE with me were so reluctant and so overwhelmed and emotional, emotional about it, their experience. They don't try to give a story or something. You feel they, they're really emotional and, and, uh, and honest about the story. What is a near-death experience, a so-called NDE? Well, a near-death experience, I, I, well, it is the reported memory of a special state of consciousness, usually happening during a critical medical situation, like cardiac arrest, or coma, or near drowning, or, or uh, loss of blood with shock in complicated childbirth, coma by traffic accident, or uh, brain damage. And there are universal elements which are told worldwide in all cultures and all times and all religions. Like first, they are aware of being dead and they can have the possibility to have perception from above their lifeless body and see what is happening in the cardiopulmonary resuscitation of a surgery. They can come into a black space, but sometimes it's frightening. They 
see light, whether they're attracted to it, whether they describe it as eternal experience. Then they can come in a totally different, unearthly dimension with beautiful landscapes, beautiful colors, beautiful music. They can meet deceased relatives that they recognize and can communicate with. They can meet a being of light or light. And usually with a being of light, they have a life review. They relive their whole life again, where each thought its word and its act is relived again from, from early childhood. And also they connect with the consciousness of others in the past. So when you had communication with someone else, you took some plaything from your five-year-old sister. You know how sad she was. You feel So you connect with the consciousness of others in the past. Something they have fused in the future, flash forward. And then it can come to a border a mountain or a mist or whatever, and they feel that when they cross this border, they will not come back. And there is a voice or a being of light or disease relative, they say, you have to go back, it's not your time yet. You've still a time, a task to fulfill. And they come conscious back into the body, which is an awful experience because the body will laugh, like, like after a traffic accident, a lot of pain and broken bones, etc., or the, the pain of a myocardial infarction. So it's an awful experience to come back in your body as well. What would you say characterizes a deep near-death experience? So a deep near-death experience is that people report a lot of elements. So not just being out of the body and seeing your own resuscitation, but all the other elements, what I told you, like meeting deceased relatives, a being of light, a life review, life preview, being a, seeing a border, etc. So the more elements are reported, the deeper and near-death experience is encoded. What triggers a near-death experience? Well, usually it is a critical medical situation, but not always. So you can have the same kind of experiences in, uh, let's say, a meditation or in isolation. Astronauts have had, Glenn and Mitchell had the same experiences in, in uh, somewhere uh, uh, close to the moon. Uh, Lindbergh had it when he flew over the, over the ocean, uh, lost in the desert, shipwrecks, all those kind of people can have it, but also without any obvious reason, so just a walk in nature. And the same kind of experience can also be told in the end of life, so in the terminal phase of illness, people can have the same experience, and we call it an end of life experience or a deathbed vision, and they have not all the, experience, all the elements, but quite a lot of the death experiences as well. And a special thing is that all patients with the near death experience, the near death experience have a transformation. They change enormously. They have no fear of death anymore. There's a new insight what is important in life. So unconditional love and empathy, first towards yourself, accept your own negative aspects as well, and then towards other and towards nature because you feel connected with everybody and with nature, with the planet Earth. And the third thing is enhanced intuitive sensitivity. You, have, you feel what others think and feel, etc. So these three after effects are also classical aspects of the near-death experience. In 2001, you and your fellow researchers published a study on near-death experiences in the renowned medical journal The Lancet. Would you tell us a bit about that study? How was it conducted? What were the results of the study? In 1988 we started a prospective study of 344 consecutive survivors of cardiac arrest in 10 Dutch hospitals to see if we could find an explanation for the cause and content of an NDE. Until that time there have only been retrospective studies, and it is still the largest study ever done about the death experience in cardiac arrest patients. And what we found that 18% of those patients reported a classical death experience, and 82% did, did not have any memory at all about the period of unconsciousness. When we tried to find out what could be the explanation that only 18% of the patients who survived cardiac arrest report a near-death experience, we compared the two groups, with and without a near-death experience. And we found that there was no difference at all in the duration of cardiac arrest, two minutes or eight minutes, 
or of chronic arrest or period of unconsciousness, five minutes of three weeks of coma, it didn't matter at all. Very short cardiac arrest in the cath lab, didn't matter at all. So the severity of a, the lack of oxygen in the brain didn't play any role if people would have an ND or not. So we could exclude lack of oxygen in the brain as a possible explanation for the cause and content of an death experience. And we also looked at medication. There was no difference between the use of medication in patients with and without an death experience. Also, fear of death, psychological explanation was the same. Religion, Christian or atheist, didn't matter at all. Gender, religion, education. So to our surprise, we found no difference at all between the 18% of patients who reported an near-death experience and the 82% who did not report. Your, your study attracted worldwide interest. How was it received in, in scientific and medical circles? Well, it was totally new, but it was important that it was published in The Lancet, which is the, one of the most important medical journals in the world. And our study was, the methodology of the study, the study design was, was very good. So that was the reason that they were accepted for publication. But the subject, the death of this, was quite new for a lot of people. And so a lot of reluctance as well to accept this kind of studies. Uh, there's a huge ignorance in the scientific community and also in the medical community about these kind of experiences. And a lot of prejudice as well. What kind of proof do you have that near-death experiences are not illusions or hallucinations caused by oxygen deficiency in the brain, as some scientists claim? Until 2000, a lot of scientists, neuroscientists, thought that it's just hallucination of lack of oxygen. But we could prove, and there have been another three prospective studies in cardiac arrest patients as well, who found the same conclusion. There's no medical or physiological or psychological explanation why people can have these experiences. According to the current, still widely accepted material paradigm, where the people think that consciousness is a product of brain function, there would be no conscious experience at all in cardiac arrest, because the brain stops functioning. So what we no, when people have a cardiac arrest, they are unconscious within seconds. The body reflexes are gone, which is a function of the cortex of the brain. The brain stem reflexes are gone, the gag reflex, you can put a finger in someone's throat. The corneal reflex or widened pupils don't react to light are clinical findings in those patients. The breathing center close to the brain stem stops functioning, so there's no breathing at all. So the clinical findings are that the brain doesn't function at all. And then there have been some reports of the registration of the electroactivity of the cortex of the brain, the EEG, which flatlines between 10 to 20 seconds. So there is no measurable electroactivity at all of the brain. And then animal studies, also the deeper structures of the brain stop functioning. Now in this period, that there's no brain, brain function at all, there are people who report an enhanced consciousness with the possibility of perception, emotions, cognition, memories, etc. And it should be impossible, according to our current paradigm, that consciousness is just a product of brain function. So we should discuss again how we could understand these kind of experiences. The paradoxical occurrence of enhanced consciousness during a period of an brain, an impaired brain function gives a lot of questions. Two years ago, you attended a conference at the Martinus Institute in Copenhagen. And um, Martinus was a Danish uh, writer and mystic who lived from 1890 to 1981. At the age of 30, he experienced um, a profound change in his consciousness that enabled him to, to, to describe a new non-materialistic world picture. One of Martinus's points is that consciousness does not emerge from the brain. 
the brain is a transmitter or it's an, it's an aerial system, Martinus says. It's not the cause of consciousness. Can the scientific study of near-death experiences tell us something about the mind-brain relationship? Yes. It's very interesting to know that Martinez had a light experience or an experience of enhanced consciousness, which we call now a near-death experience. It's an identical experience. He had all the transform classical transformation as well as people with a near-death experience. He had an enhanced intuitive sensitivity. He had contact with the higher dimensions always. He is open, what we call. So he had contact with the enhanced consciousness. And, and he knew as well as people within the death experience. And also what we tell now is that consciousness is always everywhere. Beyond time, beyond space, inside and outside our body. And our body and our brain just functions as interface of transceiver. It receives information from the consciousness and the body and the brain sends information from body and senses to consciousness. So consciousness is not produced by the brain nor by the body, but it has an interface function, like Martinez has said as well. And uh, so consciousness has no beginning and no end, it's always there. In your book you talk about what you call non-local or endless consciousness. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is that people who have a near-death experience can relive their whole past from early childhood, from, from moment of birth, sometimes even before birth. And they are connected with everything, all, all memories and, and what they have thought and done and said. And when they are in a death experience, which can take two or three minutes, they can talk for, hour, for hours to weeks about what happened, because they say everything was there simultaneously at the same moment. The moment I, I saw my whole life at the same moment. When I focused to something, I would be there. So, and they can also have future events, a preview or flash forward. So in this consciousness people experience, that the past and the future is available all at the same moment. So there is a connectedness, or what they call an entanglement, where everything what happens in the past and in the future. And it is beyond time and beyond space, which is, from the quantum physics, we call that non-locality, which is a connection, an interconnectedness, without time and without space. Everything was there. And that's what I reason, I call it a non-local consciousness. Do near-death experiences give us an indication of what happens to a person's consciousness when that person is confirmed dead. Can we see near-death experiences as a form of, of, of window to the afterlife, as some claim? Yeah, I never use the word afterlife. Uh, what I say is that there's a continuity of consciousness when the body dies. So death is the end of a physical aspect, it's the end of our body. But it's not the end of our consciousness. So there's a continuity of consciousness, and we know it from all people who had a near-death experience. But we know it also from people where you have the after-death communication, that you are in contact with the deceased relatives in the first days, weeks or months after they die. They, they can meet them, they can see them, they communicate with them, they can feel them. Uh, which is only possible as a consciousness must be still somewhere. When people tell you about their near-death experiences, are their there, are there experiences as real as any physical experience? Oh no, much more real. It, they always say near-death experience is more real than real, more real than what I know here in my physical body when I look around. What I see here around me is like an illusion. And my near-death experience, that's real. This is my home, this is where I come from, this is the only reality there is. Another aspect of the world picture of Martinus is reincarnation, rebirth in a physical organism. Can studies of near-death experiences tell us anything about the phenomenon of reincarnation? Well, first you should ask yourself, what is reincarnation and what reincarnates? I don't know. I can just say that there is a continuity of consciousness and I know that people can experience and that's what we call past life experiences. Uh, 
when you die and there is, you con you, there is a continuity of consciousness, what exactly of who you are will continue? And the next question is, what will come back? So, uh, the different opinions, like the anthroposophy, like Rudolf Steiner or the Hindus, say you come back as a, the person you are. I don't believe that. I believe that there are, you wake and call the personality you are now, your ego, is just a part of a, a higher self with capital. And this higher self, which is a light being, sends different aspects back to your new life, to your body, to learn other aspects you didn't learn in this life. So I believe in the possibility of reincarnation. I don't know exactly what comes back, what part of it comes back. And I don't know exactly when people talk about past life, if it is, was their life, or if they are connected with the consciousness of someone who lived. So because you're in the other dimension, everything is connected. Other near-death experiences that, uh, that involve the experience of, of, uh, of past lives? That's extremely yeah. rare. Extremely rare. Uh, extremely rare. rare. So I, I've heard some of them. And usually you don't relive your past lives. But we know a lot of Ian Stevenson and now uh, Jim Tucker have studied a lot of cases, more than 3,000 cases of reincarnation where children spontaneously start to talk about a past life between the age of three and five. And a lot of it is very, very well documented. And, uh, even with biological science. And usually these spontaneous reincarnation stories are based on a sudden traumatic death in the past life. So they are killed or murdered or sold, yes, whatever. And uh, sometimes even biological markers at birth. So let's just spot here and here where the bullet came on. Things here, marks are there. So if these kind of studies makes it highly possible that reincarnation Re is real. But I and Stevens have said there is no proof, but it is beyond reasonable doubt that there is reincarnation. For more than 30 years you have studied near-death experiences. Hundreds of patients have shared their stories with you. Has this had an impact on your own life, on, your, on how you view death, uh, your, on your values and so on. Totally changed. But it took some time, let's say, before I could accept that the brain doesn't produce consciousness. It takes a lot of time as well, because it's a totally different way of thinking. But when you talk to so many people with a need, I've talked to more than a thousand, I've got thousands of emails from all over, all over the world who share their ND with me. I'm now convinced that consciousness is not local and the brain doesn't produce, but it facilitates to experience consciousness. It's not a product of consciousness. Uh, the, uh, the brain doesn't produce consciousness. Um, and also, of course, our ideas are life and death change, because I'm now quite sure that there's a continuity of consciousness. And the way you live, how you treat other people, how you treat animals, how you treat nature, climate change, uh, your food, uh, all things change as well. So we, leave, we eat biological dynamic food based on anthroposophy, very uh, healthy food as well. We are both about vegetarian, my wife more strict than I, but I don't eat meat anymore. Sometimes fish, but my wife always says, Every creature that has eyes, I won't eat. So, yes. Are you afraid of, of dying? Have, have you have this fear disappeared? I'm curious. <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> um, if you were to choose one or two stories that made uh, a particular impression on you, which would they be? Yeah. I think the most impressive stories are when you can corroborate theoretical perceptions during out of body experience in an NDE. Uh, because that's an objective proof that people were really out of the body. And you can corroborate when people tell something they saw about the resuscitation, about details, and you ask doctors and nurses and family members if it happened or when it happened, then you can prove that this out of body experience happened during the moment 
of deepen consciousness. And one of the most impressive stories is for a man of 44 years old who was found in a meadow unconscious. And uh, people started to do some chest compression, but not really adequate re uh, CPR, resuscitation. And after 30 minutes, the man was brought into the coronary care unit by ambulance. They've tried to give him some defibrillation without any result. So when he came into a hospital, he was cold, already blue, no breathing, no heartbeat, no blood pressure. His pupils didn't react to light. So it was kind of hopeless man. And the first thing the nurses did is to to try to intubate the patient, to give him more oxygen. And he found out that he has dentures in him. So he took out his dentures and put them somewhere on the crash cart, on the slide underneath. And it took one and a half hour before they had blood pressure and heartbeat again. But he was still unconscious, he was in coma, had, was intubated, had artificial breathing. So they transferred him into the, to the, to the intensive care unit for the artificial respiration for one week, he was one, another one week in coma. And when he regained consciousness, he was referred to the cardiac ward again. So after one week in coma, he came back on the cardiac ward and there, when he was just there, a nurse came in for medication. He saw the nurse and said, you know where, where my dentures are. And you could, and the, door, the nurse was so surprised. He said, you were there, I took my denture, put it, it was car with all those bottles on it and there was a sliding, and there you put my teeth. And he could describe the, the small resuscitation room where he came in coma and left in coma. But he could describe it exactly from above, also what happened behind the curtain, etc. He could describe the appearances from the nurses and doctors who were busy with resuscitation. And that's a kind of proof that he really had perception in the moment there was no heartbeat, he was deeply unconscious. And, uh, and we cannot explain it with our current materialist paradigm, because according to this materialist paradigm, it would be impossible to have any conscious experience at all. There would be no subjective experience at all, at all but consciousness would be a product of brain function. What is your vision and hope for, for the future of science? Well, the future of science is that, that we have to change the definition of science. Because nowadays there is no subjective experience included. So the first person recount is just called an anecdote. But essential of who we are is what we feel and what we think. And we cannot prove, nor objectify, nor measure not reproduce, not falsify the content of our consciousness. What you feel and think, you cannot prove. So we have to include subjective experience, what we call an all-inclusive science, which includes subjective experience. And that's what we call now the post-materialist science. So it is an expanding of science which includes subjective experiences. And there's now worldwide more and more scientists are open for this new science, especially because of the study of consciousness for the last 20 years, so more and more important. And the, but let us say, there's still a lot of nice scientists, neuroscientists who look somewhere in the brain if they could find something. They will never find the consciousness in the brain. Why is research on near-death experiences uh important for us today as, as individuals, but also important uh, for society as a whole? Uh, I will say that I, I, our ideas about death define how we live our life. As long as we think that death is the end of everything who we are, we will give our energy towards a temporary materialistic society. So it's all about money, big cars, uh, beautiful body, a uh, lot of money, power, big houses, etc. But when you know that there is continuity of consciousness, you will give all your effort to change yourself, to have empathy and compassion towards others and towards nature. We destroy nature, we destroy planet Earth now, these days. 
I mean, you know that everything you do to others and to nature will ultimately come back to you, the positive and negative aspects. You will change your life as well. So our deeds, our death, define how we live our life. Pim van Lommel, thank you very much for the interview. You're welcome.